So we have a panel of distinguished experts. Uh, first off, this is Debbie Lum. She is the brains behind what we just saw, Try Hard, the documentary. She's a San Francisco filmmaker, and she gives voice to the Asian American experience and other unsung stories. Try Harder has won numerous awards and has received many accolades, one being a New York Times critics pick. It also premiered at the 2021 Sundance Film Festival. It was broadcasted on PBS. And it's uh, also a Cinema Eye Honors Audience Choice nominee and also a winner of the Audience Award at the San Diego Film Asian Festival, Best Family Film at Doc Edge in New Zealand, and a special jury prize for inspiration at the Calgary International Film Festival. Festival That is, that's a lot of awards. You know, doc, I heard about the documentary, and you know, just full disclosure too, I heard about it, but didn't see it until tonight. And, um, it just brought back a lot of memories uh, for myself as I was applying to colleges. I had the tiger mom. I had the same feelings of or pressure of get into Harvard, Yale, Stanford, um, all the top schools, the testing and all that, <clears throat> all that. So I experienced it. Um, I ended up at Northwestern, which I love because I majored in broadcast journalism and I made a career in broadcast news. Um, so. All the themes in that film, incredible. Uh, also, um, as a mother of two young boys, one is 23, the other <laughs> one is 18, I went through the pressure again. <laughs> and um, I really I really sympathize with the high school seniors, high school students today, because there, because there are so many pressures today with um, lower acceptance rates number of applicants to these colleges and the pressure to get into these schools is just incredible and, and overwhelming. So I went through that experience with um, my older son and my younger son. They had the same kind of pressure, not for me, because I'll have to tell you, as I learned as a mother and going through that same experience years ago, I made a promise to myself that I wouldn't put that kind of pressure on my sons. Um, and I think I did quite well. And, you know, we have to support them in any way we can. If they go to Harvard, if they go to UC San Diego, it really doesn't matter at this point. It's where they feel comfortable and where they think they will succeed the most. Also, we have Dr. Rona Hu, who um, she is a the medical director of the acute psychiatric inpatient unit at Stanford Hospital, specializing in the care of those with mental illnesses including schizophrenia, bipolar, and depression. She completed medical school and residency in psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco, and fellowships in pharmacology and schizophrenia research through the National Institutes of Health. Kathy Zhao, we've heard her sing <laughs> and perform. Not too long ago, she is a bilingual stand-up comedian, a leader in tech firm, in a tech firm, and a social entrepreneur. She co-founded LaughItOutHub.org, a nonprofit to empower the mental well-being of teenagers, and she does it through humor and with music, as we just experienced. Laugh It Out Hub has provided comedy workshops to the Stanford School of Medicine, Medicine and the News, Oasis for Girls, Presidio Knowles School, and many other organizations. And then we have Jan Mojabi. He is a hardware engineer working at Magnus Medical and a neuromodulation, it's a neuromodulation company focusing on the treatment of depression. During his time at Lowell, he was involved in student government, wrestling, dragon boat, peer mentoring, Shield and Scroll and Robotics Club. Welcome to all of you. I start off with Debbie. In, in making this documentary, the paper you experienced and saw all the trials and tribulations of these Asian American students. What was surprising to you when you made this documentary, and also about the challenges they faced? 
You know, it was such an amazing experience to basically go back to high school with, you know, with Keon and his class his classmate. Um, and so, I mean, it was surprises all around because, you know, there were a lot of stereotypes about these kids being, you know, just, you know, academic robots or just all they wanted the grades to get it, you know. Um, and it was nothing like that. Um, there, you know, as you could see, they each had their own, like, passions and personalities and funny and just regular kids, you know, um, who could also, you know, probably nearly cure not cancer maybe, but Alzheimer's. Yeah, I mean, they were like doing incredibly ridiculous things for 17 and 18 year olds. But I think the most surprising actually was um, living through what you read about, you know, in newspaper headlines. So, um, Everybody knows how hard it is like, to get into college. Everybody knows, okay, I'm going to apply. I'm going to get rejected. Um, but to actually see that on someone's, you know, face. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> We're gonna. I, I felt like I needed to give you a big hug after just watching. <laughs> oh my gosh! I know it's been a long time, but I mean, to actually, you know, to watch that happen um, and how hard that really is um, was really. Not surprising, it was shocking. Well, we all saw it tonight. How do you think that affects their mental health? I mean, you saw the range of emotions from, oh, I, I think I can get in to, I didn't get in. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a formative time of your life and it's incredibly powerful. And I think it takes a really long time for, for a lot of young, I don't know, I shouldn't, I could, you, maybe you should answer this. It takes a long time to, recover from that process right yeah no um <clears throat> it definitely like was pretty crushing um especially being at Lowell and you're surrounded by a lot of people who do get into the school that you want to get into and as I think Ian said in the film you at Lowell in particular you associate your self-worth oftentimes with what school with what your GPA is with what like yeah what your SAT score is and then so when like he said, when you don't get into like those schools and instead you're looking at Santa Cruz, which at the time was for me, I thought not as great of a school as what I wanted to get into. You feel like you yourself are not like great. Like you think that you're not. Yeah. So it can really take a toll on your mental health and learning after that process to like detach your sense of self-worth from just like numbers, your GPA or other things like that. And realizing you're more than just like a number, it takes a while for at least it took a while for me. And I think other people also struggle with that. So, yeah. so you end up going to UC Santa Cruz. Yeah. Was it a great fit? It must have been, right? It was. No, it was. It still was a great school. Yeah. And there was like, there's lots. I spent, I definitely think I spent the first year kind of being cynical about it. And then I realized like halfway through my like experience, I was like, well, actually, there's a lot of things to actually appreciate about the school. And that if I hadn't spent, I almost regretted like spending so much time being cynical about it that first year because it's like you miss out on a lot of great things that are there. It's just like it. It's still a great school. It's just, yeah, just changing your mentality in the way you She probably at. dwelled on like what could have been and yeah. what other people were doing, right? Yeah, yeah. And I I mean, also, there were people that when I would like talk to some of my friends from high school, so um, I'd be like, oh, I had a really hard final. And that mentality of like Santa Cruz isn't that good still perpetuated from some of my friends. And so they'd be like, how hard could it be in Santa Cruz? And it's like, <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> it's, it's still hard, man. It's calculus is not easy, but uh, yeah. yeah. So what advice would you give to today's Asian American mm -hmm. uh, teenagers, students, just from learning what you did at Lowell and then going to UC Santa Cruz? Yeah, no, um, I think uh, I like, like I've been saying, it's just do not look at like whatever the ranking is. Like it's really easy to find out still like Berkeley, LA, whatever, like this is an internalized idea of like what's a good school and what's not. Um, but yeah, like my brother right now is a senior in high school. I just had to relive this whole experience again with him. Um, it was, yeah, a little PTSD. But um, <laughs> uh, but what I've learned after like completing my degree and like graduating, it's um, like I know plenty of people who went to like these so-called like really great universities and then they didn't end up doing a whole lot afterwards. And like you think automatically, like if you go to Stanford, you go to Berkeley, instant success in life. And then I've seen on the flip side, people who go to like, no name or like lesser schools and they're out doing amazing things because it's it's not necessarily about like what the school is but rather what who you are and like what you can do yourself and any school you go to you can make it your own you can find things that interest you you can find great people um just involved in like 
different activities. There's just like a lot to do. So it's all about your like outlook on it, I think. So I would really recommend you don't don't focus on like just like the brand name of the school. It's just it, there's so much more that schools can offer. Yeah. Rona, you heard from uh Keon how he kind of dwelled in the first year. What could have been, what are my friends doing? And I think it's to some extent exas exacerbated by social media because you can see it more often now than you did years ago. Mm -hmm. Um for these students, these teenagers to seek mental health, there's there's kind of a cultural stigma that you know you seem um you seem weak if you seek help. Yeah. How do we get past that? It's getting better, but I think one of the things that I really like, and this is the second time I've seen this, I did a screening with Debbie Lum before about uh try harder, is that um we as Asian Americans have some additional challenges in getting mental health. So the stigma is more for us, even to talk about emotions, you're like, you know, just to laugh. I mean, what, who would be against laughing? Oh no, that's really embarrassing. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, the stigma is, is more difficult. We come at it from a different perspective. Um, and, um, you know, one thing that I've often talked about uh, one one thing that wasn't in my um, uh, whatever it's called the profile at, at Stanford, um, I found an Asian American theater company called Chi Pao uh, Communication Health Interactives for Parents of Adolescents and Others, and specifically to talk to parents and adolescents. Um, one thing that I often talk about is that it's not a ladder. That you know that this someone at the beginning of the film said you know. First you get into the college and then you get a job. And it's like, and if you get a grade here or whatever, people feel like if they don't reach the next rung on the ladder, that they will tumble to the ground and never and, and never recover. Um, the American system is more like a mountain. It genuinely is not a ladder. And so people can go laterally and people, and there's room on the mountain. There's not like, there was something here that um, in the film where someone said, if somebody else gets in, then I don't. It's not like that. It's truly there. There's more room. And you were saying people who have like go to no name schools. Where did Steve Jobs go? <laughs> Somebody tell me. Read. Read. That wasn't ever mentioned once on there. And then he dropped out. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So and then you know Bill Gates went to Harvard, but he dropped out. Elizabeth Holmes went to Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So um. So there. There's a lot of. It, it's more than where you go to school. You are not where you go to school. So I think that would be helpful in, in some perspective on mental health. And then as I've been talking about the linearity that some Asian parents perceive, then I'm realizing in talking in the, the um, that the, the mom talking about Taiwan, you have the exam score and that's it. It's very linear. So for her, she felt like that was more controllable. It's, but the more complicated system is actually probably more indi indicative of American life, which is, you know, everyone came here for a reason. And then also um, for, for, the, for the kid, the sort of black and white thinking, I, you know, if, if I fail this, then I'm, that's very predictive of depression. Perfectionism, among Asians is more predictive of depression than just about any other single character trait. And so what we can do to help seek mental health is things like stigma, uh, is address things like stigma. What we can do even before seeking help is to sort of put the tools in place so that we can handle different things. And so I like how you you were sort of struggling. It's like, why why is seeking help, you know, weak you were you're trying to look for the word and you know i'm looking for who all has glasses here i do if i decided and it's like i am not an inferior human being i am going to prove that i can go without glasses i would you know drive into trees <laughs> um, it would be it, it so when people are like i don't want to get help because i don't need a crutch it's like well if you sprained your ankle you should maybe have a crutch and and um, I noticed that the mom of Alvin had a walker that wasn't visible for the whole first part of it. She didn't want to mention that dad didn't finish high school. That would have been a great essay. 
And, and they were like, no, no, we're, we're not even going to talk about it. Don't even talk about it here. And then I was wondering, I mean, I don't know why she has the walker, but Alvin maybe would have had a great essay talking about some of the difficulties he had to overcome. Because Shay, who we were all rooting for, he got through, you know, he got through despite evictions and his dad and all that. I mean, you want to root for that kid. A lot of the things that you wanted to root for Alvin about, he didn't want to talk about. And I think that when we allow ourselves to be shamed and silenced by by saying, I don't need help, I, you know, I'm just gonna do this, that's um that that causes damage. It, it's, you know, other people won't be sympathetic. They'll will they'll be like, oh, those model minority machines, but also we ourselves aren't forgiving of ourselves. So part of seeking mental health, you, you asked a psychiatrist, this is a longer <laughs> <answer>. <laughs> But, but it's so important that that mental health is part of health, that the brain is not floating somewhere, you know, two feet to the side of me. This is all part of their, if, if I'm not feeling, if I'm not able to get out of bed in the morning, if I can't trust my, you know, if, if, if I don't feel like myself, then everything else doesn't actually work anyway. Kathy, how do you battle that depression? How do you address the mental health challenges of Asian American youth with Laugh It Out Hub? Yeah, because um, I grew up in China and I'm so related to the movie because my mom is a tiger mom. As I always say that, uh, you know, like uh, every Chinese mom, almost every Chinese mom have been struggling with one question. Do I want my kid to go to an Ivy League school? or to be happy, right? <laughs> Half of the Chinese moms like, I really leave school. I'd rather my daughter cry at Harvard Yard every day than smell at Arizona State. Right? And uh, probably the other half like, what is happy? <laughs> so <laughs> so when, I, when we started Love and a Hub, like, because I'm a stand-up comedian, I'm, and I have to say that I've done like over probably 3,000 shows. And I feel like the Asian audience are, always the hardest one to make them laugh. <laughs> I have to say that, I'm sorry. Maybe it's a little bit racist, but I have to say that because I know like grew up in China or like the Asian American, you were taught not to laugh too loud. It's not proper, right? You have to behave. But I feel like if you want to behave too well, I want to be too serious. Uh, there are a lot of things you don't want to say that eventually it will become part of like something in your mental health. So I think we have a we have a doctor here. You you know that. So love it how we try to use comedy as a way to vent out what do you feel is a stigma, what do you feel ashamed of? For example, like uh, one of the boys, his dad, uh, uh, like his gra didn't graduate high school because that's we feel everything we can joke about, like everything, like. That's that's our goal, and we we work with teenagers. Like, uh, we tell them, we encourage them, like to say the things that you feel like your parents probably don't want you to say, or you feel reluctant to share with your classmates or your friends or your teachers. So I think that's how we deal with mental health with uh, teenagers. Yeah, has it been successful? How receptive are your audiences, both parents? and kids. You know, it's very interesting. When we started the program, like uh, at the at beginning of the pandemic, our focus uh, target audience was underprivileged teenagers, like socioeconomically. And then some of our psychology friends, they say, oh, do you only focus on the underprivileged? Can my kids go to your program too? And then later there's like a Stanford GSD alumni uh, say like, oh, can you also provide some adult workshops for our GSD privileged <laughs> like uh, adults? I was like, sure. So I feel like it's really uh, being well uh, you know, accepted because everyone feel that they need to find a way to vent, uh, vent out their and unhappiness or like, you know, bad emotions, probably like at office when I'm working every day, you cannot vent out to your boss, <laughs> but, right? But in comedy, you can do that. By the way, um, Kathy graduated from Stanford University. <laughs> but put that in there. But, but still the Asian loser comedian. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask, uh, any, anybody chime in here? You have the, the cultural barriers of, you know, just stick through it. 
keep a main focus on the prize, that being getting into the top college, um, being the best in your class. How do you break through those cultural barriers and say, it's okay if you're number two, it's okay if you don't go to Harvard or Yale. I mean, how do you deal with that? Debbie? <laughs> Put me on the spot. I'm, I'm a mom too. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm not a tiger mom. I promise. Not really. But, um, <laughs> it, you know, I think it's, um, it, we live in this world of, you know, social media. I've got my phone right here. There's so, it's not just low high school where there's so much competition. It's just pervasive everywhere. It's really hard not to compare yourself to other people. We live in a tough time right now, with the pandemic and post pandemic. Um, and, you know, to Rona's point, um, I think for our community, especially immigrants, um, you know, um, I'm fourth generation, but I'm still the child of immigrants it's this survival mentality that we're still stuck in this survival mentality. We're stuck in this, you know, we don't have many options. We've limited choices. And so we have to, and the only way we can do it is by being better and perfect than everyone else. Um, and like, you know, I would say to just pause and say, that's a normal feeling. Everyone feels that way. It is real. Like what you're feeling that, that reality that, where it's a tough time, you know, it's a tough time. But um, I don't, I mean, part of making um, Try Harder was really to just give voice to who we are um, and to say it's okay to be human, to be like have ups and downs and have flaws and imperfections and have the phone go off when it's <laughs> totally fine. And, um, you know, uh, and I think it um, it's like you kind of have to widen your scope and look at the options. And um, I mean, a lot of your friends that you went to school with are went through a really hard time and they're doing OK. Right. Yeah. They're actually, you know, it, it's like it's a it's. It, I think it's 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 hard to do that, but you really do. And and the other thing I'm saying, why you're putting me on the spot is because usually when people ask me what's the advice that you would give, I, I think it's very difficult to give anyone advice, really, especially a teenager. It's like they have to figure it out themselves, right? I mean, yeah. I, I think I think there's got to be more than um, it's okay, it's okay, because those are just words. You need some really solid support. How do you get that support going on? So I have um, uh, thoughts for teens and also for adults, but you, your audience is more teens and my audience is, is more their parents. And so um, one is that, like you, like you said, Debbie, if, if you just tell people just relax, that's surprisingly ineffective. I've never, <laughs> I've never been able to, like when people tell me that I usually get madder. <laughs> but, but to sort of recognize, you know, as I was saying about the linearity, as, the, as Alvin's mom said, as, um, as, as I've known from, you know, my own parents and so forth, there was a reality to that. So if you, feel in your heart of hearts, this black and white thinking that you have to succeed. You're not a bad person for that. That was the reality where you came from. And then the reality of coming here is different. So, you know, in, in China, there's the Dachau or Gaokao. Gaokao. Okay. So Gaokao is, you know, there you are. Um, a, a neighbor who's, you know, who was interviewing for one of the tech companies was sort of like, I'm so tired of Indian people telling me that they went to IIT and what the test score is. I don't want to know the test score. I can see their test score. I'm trying to interview them and they, all they can talk about is their test scores. Um, and so allow yourself that you maybe had ideas that you grew up with that were true then and, and that you're not a bad person for still having some of that, but that now it's a little bit different. Allow that your children are not fully myelinated in their brains until they're about 25. So how old are you? 23. <laughs> He's fully myelinated. But like that that's that that's not a bad thing. That's normal. And that there's um that there's gonna be bumps along the way. And so, you know, so the advice for parents, if if like like you, I, I'm sort of hesitating telling it advice, but 
is, is to sort of allow yourself and your children some compassion. And also in talking about feelings that, um, that they exist and that just denying them doesn't help. So, um, you know, there's a technique called compassionate listening, which is, I think, even more important for children than for adults, which is that rather than when I say to my husband, um, you know, I was in the hospital for 12 hours today. If he says, good thing tomorrow, Saturday, I don't feel listened to. If he said, if Stanford's so hard, you should quit and go somewhere else. I don't feel listened to. <laughs> if he says, well, just, you know, or the worst is if he says, wait, you left at eight and you came back at eight, but then you must have driven and parked. So you were only 11 hours in the hospital. <laughs> so don't, so don't do that. If, if you're, if you're with your children, they're sort of like, I'm so stressed. If you say it'll be okay, they're not, this is, or, you know, um, you know, I love you even if you fail. Um, <laughs> but but it's sort of like, you know, what you know, what are you tell me about the stress? And it's like I didn't study so for so a lot of the the little plays that we do are about, you know, rather than say you should have studied, um, which again is not that helpful when they haven't. Um is is to say is 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 to say, oh no, you know. What happened? I was like, I don't know. Like, oh well, you know, I I look forward to hearing about it when you come back from the test. I hope the test isn't as bad as you thought. Um, so this is so that ability to keep the channels open. Um, and then if you're going to share stories about yourselves, I'm I'm speaking to mostly parents here, so um, I'll try not to neglect the kids. But if you if you're um, people are like, you know, I try to tell inspirational stories about myself, you know, so I went uphill, I had to take the train to get to school and walk in the snow, uphill both ways, you know, the kids don't actually feel that good about that, they feel guilty, <laughs> they, they feel like, you know, like, I, I had to do more than you do, and you don't appreciate it, right, but if, if at the right time you say, I remember how scared I was. That's that's compassionate. That's that's and, something and actually that that's part of why I, I make films too. It's really about um, shining a light on something. You know, you're talking about being able to hear somebody, and everybody needs everyone needs attention. Even Asian Americans need attention. <laughs> it's a weird thing to say, but because we are so used to living in the shadows and 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 being kind of you know, off on the wings or being, you know, second. I mean, I, you know, Lowell High School is a very different universe than what I grew up with. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin. Oh, um, no. I grew up in Missouri. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, which one's harder? Mm -hmm. Which one's worse? I'm just kidding. Yeah, we keyed on, on who had it harder. I think uh, part of the problem may be, as we saw in the film, that parents knowingly, maybe unknowingly, put their needs first before the needs of uh, their kids. So in other words, uh, oh, you, you should apply to Stanford, Yale, Harvard, because then you'll succeed. But what if the, um, the young man, the young woman, doesn't feel like they would belong there, but it has that moniker of Ivy League? I know that for Kian, that law is a pressure cooker. So you got out of that pressure cooker. How? Would you change things? What What do you think should be changed in order for there to be less pressure at schools like Lowell? I mean, that's. <laughs> um, I mean, we saw through the film; it's very competitive. Yeah, I mean, or Pali, or Gun, or Monte Vista, or anything in Cupertino. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, all of these. <laughs> any school with a lot of Asians. And what would have made you feel better and less pressured? Um, I mean, I think there's like air, two areas that like the pressure can come from. And like one is like from your class space as well, which I think is kind of difficult to control. I mean, you're always going to be comparing yourself. But one thing that really helped me while I was going to Lowell was the support I received from my parents. Uh, they were pushing me a lot. They gave me a lot of pressure, but they would be like checking in with me. Like, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to like take all these APs or do all these different activities? Mm -hmm. And to know that like, because I think there is, like Alvin said, like there's a 
good amount of pressure and then there's also like bad pressure and you don't want it to like slip into this unhealthy amount of pressure where you're just like killing yourself um and i think at the school one uh, aspect is the wellness center i don't know if uh, if you remember from a film that you was like oh yeah i've never been in there i heard they make tea or something like the and that was the same experience for me or i've i've heard about the wellness center at my school and it was like kind of like this thing that you know existed but like they never really promoted it that much or at least Mm -hmm. my experience it wasn't and so it's like they just it felt more like something they just get to say was there and like see we have resources for students it's right that you can come in anytime and get some nice tea and sit on a comfy couch and like what that's not real support for students and especially like students at Molek with there's a lot of mental health challenges. There was someone who committed suicide while I was there. Mm-hmm. Like there's a lot of different pressures, especially already as a teenager, but especially at Mole. And so I feel like if there were more resources that were better publicized, more like funding towards them to provide students with the resources that they need, I think that would really help a lot as well. Do you think the students would be drawn to that uh, um, knowing that maybe they're you know, the, the other students are, are looking at them, the, the the whole, oh, I shouldn't appear weak, I shouldn't appear like, you know, I don't have it together. Well, I think there's ways that you could you could implement having a belonging center that would be mindful of that and allow students to maybe anonymously, like, reach out for help or without, like, because, yeah, especially in that age, you're always comparing yourself, you don't want people to see that you're going to get mental health right. help. Even as an adult now, like, talking about, like, if you're going to get, like, see your therapist like that you still feel like kind of stigmatized it's mm-hmm. very difficult to openly admit that oh yeah i'm going to go see a therapist like so even for a high schooler it's probably a hundred times worse so yeah i think if you the school made ways that you can kind of honestly just reach out and say like hey, I, I need help like please it, yeah I, actually i i i was wondering like for is it like a, i feel it is like the society's job to let everyone know that you don't need to be number one in school Oh, you don't need to really go to an Ivy League school to be something, someone really amazing. Like we have film work or what? I feel like our Asians or Asian Americans always focus on, uh, like that. I call it LED, lawyer, engineer, doctor. It's mm-hmm. like only when you have those three jobs. Like oh, you went to a, you went to Ivy League school, you become those great mm-hmm. occupations. You are a successful person. That's not true. Like President Joe Biden, he went to the University of Delaware. It's like Steve Jobs that never finished the first year of college. Agree. Yeah, <laughs> agree. And we we never send those message to students, especially among our Asian American societies. I think like is well, it like the society yeah, we, we need to we need to it, promote it more? It's very different though. I mean, and I mean, you know, when I was growing up, um, my parents were not immigrants. I'm like fourth generation, but I was my all my friends were the children of first generation immigrants. And at that in that era, you know, no. But if you were Asian American, you didn't go. You didn't want to spend them. You went for like you don't want to spend the money on a private, fancy degree. You wanted the value mm-hmm. education. Like you would go to the state schools. Like there's this real strong belief in like the UCs and the state schools as Asian Americans. That's what I always saw around me. I don't know if you felt that way, Rona, but there there was. It wasn't the same. I had friends in college whose parents were like, I, I, I mean, I'm embarrassed now to say I went to Brown University, um, but uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to get into Brown today. I wouldn't be as good of a student as these kids were, are, were I, you know, as you were. And um, but my friend who went to Brown, who was Asian American, his dad was really mad at him for, you know, like putting him in debt. When he could have gone to a UC, and it used to be like that, actually. There used to be much more of a kind of modesty around it, I think. Um, and just not just Asian Americans, like people in general. I mean, we just all used to kind of not. So what do you think changed? Kind of is it just societal pressure? Is it social media? Competition? It's, I mean, it's we're living in a world of extremes. And I mean, there is a lot of truth to these degrees. They help you in, in some way or other, in one way, not in finding happiness and not in finding, um, you know, not in living a long life and not maybe seeing your children grow up and have children of their own and be, remain like having a great relationship with them. But I mean, I think um, that when you say what can people do to reduce the pressure it in some ways it has to come from the top down there's another film that should be made about the college industrial complex about all the the money and the marketing and the trying to get the lowest percentage so that you get the highest ranking so that you're you know you're failing all you're rejecting all of these kids so that it looks better 
and your endowment grows. I mean, and all of the industry around that, all the tutoring and the, you know, all that, it's, you know, the colleges could say, you cannot apply to 26 colleges. That's not, we're not gonna allow that. If you apply to more than four Ivy Leagues, you're disqualifying yourself or something like that. They limiting, could do that. Limiting the number of APs, because there's this kind of arms race of APs where, you know, it's sort of like there's there's no point in having that many APs. Yeah. Um, you were asking what what it was like. I had an interesting thing, and I'm I'm glad, Lisa, that you mentioned about you know it's like I didn't you know suffer. I was told all my entire life that you know you have to get into Stanford. I have two brothers. You have to get into Stanford. You have to get into Stanford. All three of us got into Stanford. My older brother went. My younger brother went. We didn't have enough money when when I was so. I thought part of that was because I was a girl. Where's, where's your guitarist who was saying <laughs> yes um so so I was of course furious because and I went to UCSD and so um you know now now I'm faculty and and another thing I forgot to put on my on my thing is that I was associate dean for the medical school which was very funny because my mom didn't like my going to psychiatry, which is mental health and we have to talk about these things so for a long time when people asked you know it's like Oh, even my daughter is faculty at Stanford Medical School. I was like, which area? <laughs> I'm like, Mom, I'm going to be associate dean starting in January. And she's like, are you going to be dean? And I'm like, no, I, I don't think so. I was like, how many associate deans are? It's like multiple. It's like, so what's the point of being a <laughs> So, I mean, that kind of pressure. Um, I, I tried not to, like you were saying, I, I, I relate to you so much, Debbie, uh, um, you know, try not to put that pressure. And and Lisa, I think you were also saying for your, you know, you, you're you not, I think we're all trying not to be tiger moms. You know, when my daughter, um, you know, was applying, I I was deliberately was like, she is going to get into the school that is home for her, you know, and it might be Stanford. I would love for her to be close by. Um, but it might also be very awkward for her, for for me to be there all the time, like like Alvin's mom <laughs> on the first day of Berkeley. Um, oh, and that's another. Oh, I should get to that point. Okay, so so I I deliberately, you know, uh, volunteered for move-in day pretty consistently for the uh, at Stanford. And part of it was to actually help them move in, but part of it was to be a spy for my theater group because, because there was so much material. One of the things that I noticed with um, Asian families that was different than non-Asian families was that all of the kids were trying to walk a block and a half ahead of their job where they're sort of like, you know, Alvin, Alvin, wait up, <laughs> you know. But, um, but I think the immigrant parents, not just Asians, but Latinos too, were very hurt by that and that was something that um that as i watched the white parents um you know um and black parents a lot of times you know if the if the kid was like oh you know you know it's like i can do it myself whatever then they'd be like yeah, okay and then they'd look over at another parent and be like you know he can do it himself <laughs> and and there there was a moment there and i think that for a lot of the immigrant parents when they were sort of like you know mom i can you know like, I don't carry my suitcase, you know, and um, I, I watched as a mom brought fruit for her, an Indian mom brought in like fruit for her, you know, daughter, and then she was, was like, mom, they're Stanford, they have fruit, I was kind of like, but I washed it for you, and it's like, I can wash my own fruit, and the mom was so wounded, and I realized that because she would never have talked to her mother that way. And so there was this very different thing where in the U.S., teenagers, they talk back to their parents, then their friends later. Here, it's sort of like you listen to me or, or you know, or you're against me. And so that was something that I really wanted to, like, you know, take all of the immigrant parents and be sort of like, they all do this. You haven't, <laughs> you haven't done, you know, it's like they're not ashamed of you because you've done something to deserve it. You know, you, you know, and it was kind of like, I'll take the fruit. <laughs> I feel like the, the mental support program should also include the parents. Yes. I think yeah. the parents is the, I don't want to say the problem. <laughs> <laughs> We're of the government. parent. 
Right. But yeah. I think it's their lack of understanding of how the school system works and the um, the society in general. Yeah. You know? Acting like we're not part of it right. is not helping. And then I was also thinking, because like you never went in and none of the people there ever went in. It should be opt out instead of opt in. Not mandatory like you always have to come, but like at the beginning of the year or at regular intervals, people just should just be like, hey, how are you doing? And they're like, fine. It's like, here, have an energy bar. I'm like, thanks, fine. And then, but then that way, as they see people coming in and out, the, the stigma of, I saw someone going into the wellness center. So if it's just kind of like on a semester basis, quarterly basis, you have these like check-ins. And then, then when you're in there, you can say like, I'm fine. Everything's fine. Like, okay. It's like, right. you know, and then someone can say, I was, if, you know, my, my dad never comes home or I was evicted or my mom's a single mom or I'm working at the ice cream place and people drop their cones. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can, these are all like stresses that part of life is stress. And if you don't get to talk about it, it's just sad. And I think it's unfortunate that you don't know about these services, these mental health services, until it's too late. You've heard about the suicides on campus, yeah. you know, be it college or in high school. So I think it's really important from the get-go, when you get into college or even in high school, that, hey, we're here to listen to you. But would, would students be open to that, Keon? <laughs> um. I mean, I can't speak for all students about like how they would feel, but I think the younger generation has a, a more open, like they, it's, it's, they're more open and receptive to talking about mental health. I think you know, one of the ways that I've seen a lot of like young people do with it is a lot of humor, kind of like really dark humor, but like talking about like wanting to jump off a bridge and like, ah, like it's, um, but I think people are able to, I think, yeah, kind of use humor to express those feelings. And, and like, even like, like, like pop music or like or just popular music in general, there's a lot of discussion about like being depressed or like, so I think that there has been a little bit of a shift more. And I think the young generation is able to talk and seek out for, or like talk and yeah, look for mental health resources a lot and, more. And how much is social media playing a part, social media for good? Um, <laughs> I, for, uh, I, I personally, I really don't like social media a lot. And I feel like, cause it, for me, I know it had like an impact on my mental health and like, particularly like, yeah, like Instagram, you just like go through like highlight reels of everyone's life. So like when you have like a bad day, you go open up your phone, you see someone's going to Cabo and you're like, ah, oh, crap, I had a bad day, they're in Cabo, and like life's terrible. So, but I think there, there also can be a good thing if, um, like in TikTok or other like spaces where you open up the floor for discussions about mental health or people share their negative experiences. And then you can know that there are people out there going through the same issues and struggles that you go through. I think that can be really beneficial. Rather than seeing maybe the videos of, I got in, yeah. or, I got mm -hmm. accepted by a dozen universities. Maybe a video of, I didn't get in, but I'm moving forward. I'll find yeah, there was it. actually one, one uh, video recording I saw recently. It's like all the kids got a rejected letters. They would say, oh, I got rejected. Everyone was laughing. And each one by each one. So normalizing. it's like, yeah, normalizing it. I think that's the normal way. Yeah. You always get rejected, then you get accepted. Yeah. And, and for me, I remember keeping a rejection letter, not only from the college admissions, but also one of my jobs. And just keeping it as just to light fire in my belly that I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to do what I want to do and be happy about it. So. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the power of like transcend. It's like humor is also another way. It's like you make tragedy into comedy, like to transcend it. I think it's hard though for students these days to see that right away that things will get better. So I think as parents, we need to talk to them about, hey, we went through the same thing, you know, um, just because you didn't get it now doesn't mean you're not going to get it in the future. You know, I also want to take some questions from the audience. So you have I just wanted to say that I'm in a lull on this. So I um, advise on the film and I'm going to carbon date myself and say that this year will be my 45th high school reunion. <laughs> um, I think the big difference when I went there and I'm fourth generation on my mom's side, my dad was an immigrant. And um, my friend John Chuck is now a retired family physician with Kaiser Summit. So his job not only his 
private practice, but also overseeing the well being of the over 10,000 physicians and healthcare practitioners. Um, he was really sad when he saw the film. Um, I'm friends with Benjamin Bratt, the older sister. We were best of friends. Um, and so Benjamin Bratt got to see the film and just applauds Debbie, but we were all sad. And the difference is, I think there are more immigrant families now. So it's sort of a survival mentality, flying your way when you're like in a crap bucket. And um, so John Chuck, uh, the physician said to me, you know what, we were really fortunate because most of us grew up in two parent, and I add the word loving households, so not all two parent households are functional or supportive. Um, but then we also had another community outside, and so a large Chinese American community and your grandparents. So there is a difference there, and I really am an advocate of just that family dinner. I just had a, a birthday. I hosted a birthday dinner for my uncle, my mom's older brother. My mom's no longer with me, but my uncle who's 96 years old. And so it's really just family and appreciating the little things. So it's – and then – Social media, I don't do, I, you know, I did computer science. I was a mathematician before I became an attorney. It's about people. It really is. And not comparing salaries. And I will tell you that every single one of my reunions, no one's talked about their salary, what car they drive, their titles. It's all about like, oh, how's your family? Oh, remember when your brother and you did that crazy thing and how was your brother? So it really is about humanity. And hopefully we just get back there to that time where people could just talk to one another. And if you're having a bad day, you could just talk to somebody and and not make it such a big deal. But it really is, I mean, and I'll leave you with this one last thing. So it was funny, um, Donna Schmidt, you know, Rachel's mom, I said, Donna, you were more of a tiger mom than any Asian mom. Ever <laughs> and she's like, am I? And I said, so how did you get that line where your Ivy League education, like your union tickets or whatever you want to do? And it turns out that in her role in, in finance, most of her colleagues were um, immigrant Chinese uh, women. And that's how she kind of got that same mentality. Uh, so she is Chinese, basically. Yeah. And like, and like, Avery Wong here, he's a Palo Alto parent. We we're trying to bring that eighth grade algebra back to our school. So while we're talking about the pressure cooker schools and these and getting into the university, we're dumbing down our curriculum. I, you know, loved Cal, went to Cal, double majored in pure math and statistics. At well, I didn't feel smart enough to take calculus. I started a scholarship at UC San Diego where I did my graduate work. There is now not a single U.S. citizen in the graduate math and statistics programs. And I combined my love of math and, and law and politics to have a scholarship where someone's using mathematics or statistics for civic engagement and social justice. Yeah. And I'm old enough to have worked on the Dr. Wen Ho Lee case. And more recently, Sherry Chen, Professor Shaoxing Street. So it really angers me as a Chinese American woman that we go out recruiting. And it, I, I do think it's a national security issue. But then we turn around and look at these naturalized Chinese American scientists, brilliant scientists, and accuse them of being spies. And then the Department of Justice drops the charges. Unheard of in the past, but that's what's happening now. And it's ruining people's lives. So we have to stop and think as a society, what are we doing to people in general? And you know what? Stop, stop the social media because as people say, don't compare your insides with someone's outside. So that's my <laughs> sermon for the day. And um, good sermon, good sermon. <laughs> so so put the stuff away, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not going away. You know, so it's not like we can we can get rid of it. And it it can have some uses, but we are biologically mammals. Mm -hmm. We are our, our stress hormones, all sorts of things will go down as we're with each other. And then of course we had a pandemic and that became very difficult. But if you're scrolling all day, and especially if everybody else seems to be having a better time than you then you will get stressed. I mean, I, I can just like, you know, put little monitors on you and watch you get stressed while you do that. And then and then you go out and I, I love your idea of the, the family dinner, but also, as you said, community. Um, link up with each other, link up with other Asians, link up with other people who aren't Asians. You know, we're, we're when they talk about fight or flight, there's also flock. And, you know, by by being with each other and and helping each other. Um, another thought on, on normalizing it was I remember I was giving a talk for the Asian sorority here at Stanford and everyone else. The, the, my room was empty 
I, I could see sorority girls outside, but no one was going to come in. So I was just sitting there waiting. And then one of the sorority sisters came in and, and to give me a bottle of water and the room filled up. But nobody <laughs> wanted to be sort of like, hi, I'm interested in mental health. So so us being able to normalize with each other and just say, you know, I've had a really bad day or I'm scared about this pandemic or something, and then be able to, to you know, talk to your neighbors, your friends. And uh, I, actually, I think one complicating thing about, um, about Asian Americans getting together is how much we've been othered by so that people will say, oh, you know, the uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act doesn't apply to you or you guys are, you know, I like you guys better. Um, so, you know, you guys are the model minority. You guys are, you guys are whatever. Oh, I started a clinic at Stanford, specifically Stanford Mental Health for Asians Research and Treatment. I did not call it Asian Mental Health Treatment because then no one would come. I wanted people <laughs> to be, so it's called Smart Clinic, Stanford Mental Health for Asians Research and Treatment, <laughs> so that if it's on your phone, then people are like, what's that? Oh, SAT prep. You know, <laughs> um, you know so I mean, other people are sort of like, oh, well, that's kind of a microaggression too, because it's a model minority. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll work on that. I'll come up with something better. <laughs> but, but something where people can come and then if they want to talk to their friends and say, yeah, I'm seeing a psychiatrist. I was really depressed. Then they can't, but they don't have to. And so by like normalizing it, then people can can be like, yes, and then and gain strength from each other. Uh, I don't want to forget the people who are watching online. There is a question for you, Kia. Knowing just from the documentary and knowing what you know today, would you have gone to Lowell we know that track. It would, if you had gone to another school, would you have better chances of getting to, quote, a better college? This is from like a formal alum. Yeah, um, <laughs> I've been asked that question a lot before. Um, I think all things considered, I would still go to Lowell. I mean, there's always that weight of like, oh, um, you go to a like less intense school, but then and you probably could get into a better school, um, better at college. Um, but all things considered, despite the like stress, everything that I went through, like it, it took a toll on mental health. The experiences and I think the work ethic that going to Lowell like instilled in me, I wouldn't trade for maybe an easier experience at another high school. And genuinely going to Lowell, like my first year or two at Santa Cruz were easier than going to Lowell. And I, I like going to Lowell, like really did, um, it's just, it helped me a lot with like the way that I care myself. And I think that led to like my work now. Like I think it's just, both students typically are like really hard workers and um yeah so it uh, it can make or break you but i think if you can get through it um it can be for like a positive even if you yeah it's, it can be really stressful i know but yeah i still would consider going and you had a great group of friends mm -hmm. you always i mean part of why we filmed Keon was he had a social life and he had a lot and we would always hang out with you know with you and your friend I mean you guys would all be studying at the same time but you would you know and these I mean oh yeah no, we still part. um yeah we, we still keep in touch I think I just had um I, I Julian I don't know if you remember like he had a barbecue so there was like a lot of people like like Selena Jaina like all those other like more we still keep in touch um pretty frequently so yeah it's like a really like yeah you, you meet a lot of really good lifelong friends there so Another question is, and anybody here on the panel can answer this, for those uh, kids that are still going to low or those who have graduated, how do you get rid of that mindset of perfectionism? Uh -huh. Easier said than done. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you, did you have a thing? No, no, I'm so good. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned that for younger people, that it's the, the stigma around mental health is shifting. And um, we were communicating with the current law, like the Jonathan Chu of today, he's the current president of um, the law student body. And um, uh, their name is Sasa, they're Philippinex, non-binary, um, all about mental health. And so I thought they were really inspirational. Um, uh, 
small petite little person um, with a huge voice and was doing um, videos about uh, wellness, about, you know, dealing with coping with depression and, and wellness um, as the, while she, while they were the president of, of the student body. So I think that's definitely a shift, don't you think, in terms yeah. of, of, of um, you know, reducing the stigma. I think there's a big cultural shift that's happening a little right now. Maybe if kids are having more fun or trying to have more fun, I don't know. Is that possible? They had a lot of fun, actually, when we were filming. Yeah. Uh, maybe we did a disservice by not having the whole movie be like 90 minutes of fun. But I mean, I saw you guys having a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah <laughs> no, I mean, it was, you know, there's a lot of school ethic, but then there's still like, yeah, lots of social, I mean, I mean, we did have dances, even though some people didn't know that we had dances. Um, mm -hmm. And as someone yeah, on student government, it was really annoying when people didn't come to the dances. But there were still people who would yeah show up. And I think yeah, there was a, a community of people. I met like there's a lot of great individuals, and you would. I think yeah, it's the even though you were all studying the library, the library was like a social hub of all, and so you would have like a lot of interactions stuff like that. And yeah, I don't know, it, was, it was pretty cool. I think in terms of perfectionism. Like we need to encourage more mistakes. So like we need to encourage more failures. So I think normally, um, because I grew up in China, it's like uh, on the TV, like all the anchors are so serious. If they like pronounce one word, they have to be punished for like a uh, fifty, I think fifty RMB like that. But when I was watching the uh, US TV, it's like everyone can make fun of each other, you know, even at the, uh, the election de they're debate. They're punished. For yeah, they're literally punished. So, yeah. So I was like. Oh my gosh, because in China, I feel like it's still like the Asian culture, like you have to be serious, you cannot make mistakes. But I mean, in reality, everyone has to make mistakes or you won't be successful. It's all the mistakes like they did to your success. Mm -hmm. So I feel like uh, in high school, maybe we should we should have, uh, we, should, we should like encourage more of the perceptions like, oh, you need to go through failures. But even I think the uh, Jonathan Chu, the great guy, I think he probably can give a presentation. We, we talked to Jonathan Chu. Um, we interviewed him about his college. Um, and actually, he did not get into, am I allowed to say this? Um, his, his dream program. Did you know that? No. Because um, he got into Harvard and he got into the Boston Conservatory of Music, I think uh -huh. it's called. And there's a, actually a, a dual program oh. where like they, it's like a combined degree. And that was actually his dream, but he didn't get into the two combined. I mean, he did have a Juilliard like audition that and all this kind of crazy his, stuff. That explains his facial expression. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was really interesting where everybody's like, yeah, he got in and he was like, <laughs> well, I mean, he's a, he was genuinely humble. Very yeah, humble spirit. yeah Very it was the nicest guy. Yeah. He did not want to make people yeah. feel bad about their. Yeah. He would never boast about things. Like, that was nothing else yeah. to agree about. Yeah. He was just very, very humble and just, yeah, like. But I, I thought it was interesting how kind of unhappy he looked as people <laughs> were talking about that. And I was wondering. So thank I you for explaining. Well, that. I don't think he enjoyed being the, the yeah. hero. Oh, no, he did he really, not want to. He, he was like, oh, no, no, no. He would always yeah. be like, don't, please don't like shine light on yeah, me. Yeah, That's why but, I, yeah. But yeah. I want to share one more thing about him. He, he said to us, you know, like, I may be the winner right now. Um, this is, what was it, 17 or 18? And I got into all these schools, but, you know, later on in life, maybe this is just my time, and later on in life, someone else is going to, and it won't be me. And I thought, God, he is also wise, it's crazy. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> no, I mean, that's so true in life. I mean, it's just, you're going to have, you're going to win some, and you're going to lose but some. we introduced him to Justice Stephen Breyer, because we got to do a virtual screening <laughs> to the Sundance. So I said... Justice Breyer meet Jonathan Chu. Jonathan looked like Jesus because he had thrown out his hair during the <laughs> There was an awkward pause and I said, the virtual so violin. I was like, oh yes. So hopefully you know the connections there. But I, I just think, you know, it's it's really about the people in the end. And after I saw I didn't want to see it ahead of time. And so I wanted to watch it with people. And I so Debbie and I kind of looked at each other and said, you know what? In the end, everything works out. I know that kids are young and they don't want to hear them, they don't understand, but it works out. I mean, I have a colleague who recently retired. He went to Yale and we made the same salary as state attorneys. And I'm like, hey, who's the smarter one? Because I went to UC and it didn't cost me a lot of money. <laughs> I think you have to give some some hope and optimism and such 
tough, mentally tough times to these kids. I mean, Asian American youth, I mean, youth all around because there's so many pressures that they face and so many uh, challenges that they face. And even harder now with public transportation and the lack of safety, especially yeah. for Asians and Asian women. So it's a really good Well, hopefully tonight we uh, learn some words of wisdom from our, from our panelists and walk away with what we can do that we need to listen and to feel. Um, and just support our kids. Can Thank I you. say something yeah, sure. before we end? Of course, like uh, our Love It Out Hub, actually we are hosting a comedy night event uh, sponsored by San Francisco Veteran Organization, and it's for mental health. So it's on May 20th. If anyone is interested in coming to our show, uh, I think we put the link online, and also I have a code like you can scan for the tickets. So we should listen, learn, and laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much for joining us.